Hello and welcome to this episode of our Rhinoplasty for Residents and the Foundations of Facial Plastic Surgery webinar series. We really hope you have a great time watching this show. Thanks, Cam, and greetings to everybody. Um, so, guys, let me just get to the beginning. Um, this is Back to Basics, and um, and Peter, you're talking about lateral cruel uh, steels. I'm afraid that's that's for another time. We really, uh, I think the, the important thing, obviously, uh, is that is that we want to understand what a normal nose should look like, and so that's really the emphasis of my talk. Um, this is where I'm coming from. This is this is where I stay, and this is a this is a little teaser for anybody who might be interested in coming to. Uh, Cape Town and, and PE next year for the Sorsa July International Symposium. We're going to hold a, a pre-congress in uh, Cape Town and then move up to Port Elizabeth uh, and you're all very welcome. Um, so uh, we know that the nose occupies a really important central mid-facial position and, uh, and really small changes can impact very significantly uh, not just on the nose but in in fact, on the nasofacial and facial aesthetics. So it's really important to know the ideal. And the, it's one of the fundamentals to develop proficiency in rhinoplasty. The first thing is we've got to know our anatomy. And the second thing is we've got to know what is normal. Um, and an understanding of ideal nasal proportions and angles assists both with the clinical evaluation It both qualifies and quantifies the variance from ideals, and it informs the process of surgical planning. Facial and nasal proportions and angles are easily determined in the office just from basic photographic assessment. And really this is the basic uh, uh, measure that we use before every single surgical case. And I think one of the things Peter was alluding to is we, we spend time discussing um, the anxiety before surgery and I can certainly say that the better prepared you are and the more you know how you have to manipulate a nose the less anxiety you will feel it's no guarantee but you've got to spend a lot of time planning the other thing is it also facilitates effective communication with your patient uh, patient that develops trust and probably most importantly I think it also facilitates our development as rhinoplasty surgeons because we are able to critically evaluate our results because we know these ideals. So what is the ideal nose? Well, we can break it down really into nasal shape, which refers to the different nasal contours. We can look at the intrinsic nasal proportions. So for example, this is the balance between the nasal tip and the dorsal length. Uh, and then we can look at the nasofacial proportions which is really how the nose relates to the face. Uh, this may in selected cases modify the extent, for example, that we reduce a nasal tip projection or lower the dorsum. And not infrequently, we also need to give attention to other areas of the face to harmonize the result. Um, and then this evening, just from a practical point of view, we're gonna look at these different components on frontal profile and basal view and I'm afraid there's no simple way I'm going to be throwing a whole lot of angles and measurements at you and some of these you've just got to learn certainly over time you become more proficient if you've got a good eye sure you can see it but the reality is that you need to quantify and qualify these uh, before surgery and I think the other important concept is that they you know there, there are lots of differences. Uh, there's differences and unfortunately this evening we don't have time to look at all of them in terms of ethnic uh, differences, gender and age. But it is important that we should be mindful of these ideals and facial angles as they apply to the patient's ethnicity, age and gender so that rejuvenation procedures can be performed with the goal in mind of achieving an attractive and harmonious appearance. So this is the, the basic overview. We're going to start off from frontal, the frontal view. And we know um, that the, uh, Leonardo da Vinci divided the, 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 the face into thirds. Um, the upper third from the trachea to the glabella, the glabella to the subnasale and subnasale to the mentum. 
but we also know that in the different ethnic groups, that in fact, these are not all equivalent. But interestingly, in terms of aesthetics, the more equal, and this is regardless of ethnicity, the more equal these are, in fact, the higher the degree of attractiveness. If we look at the lower third, that can also be further divided into thirds. So from subnasale to, uh, to stomium, labiomental groove, and then to mentum, those should be equal thirds. And then you'll be familiar with the phi or the golden ratio, that's one to 1.68, which describes all the beautiful things and the worlds of, of flowers. And um, the ratio of the upper to the lower lip should be one to 1.618. And just interestingly, if you drop vertical lines from the medial limbus, those should intersect at the oral commissures. Um, and then the vertical proportions, um, we know that the, the, the face can be divided into, into fifths vertically, each fifth representing one eye width. Um, and then we know that the width of the nose, we'll get to that now, the width of the nose represents one eye width and the intercanthal distance should be one eye width. Stuart, we seem to have lost your, um, your uh, audio. You just have to unmute. There yeah, we go. Sorry. I don't know what happened there. Sorry, and so what I want to just point out quickly, there's two aspects related to, to uh, first of all, to the intercanthal, intercanthal width and dorsal height. Uh, and the first is that a lower dorsum and radix creates the illusion of a wider intercanthal distance. And the corollary is true as well, is that a higher dorsum creates the impression of a narrow intercanthal distance. And this is important when we're assessing the face. So just when we speak about the, the fifths and the intercanthal distance, it is an important assessment because if you've got someone who's got a narrow, uh, a narrow intercanthal width, what you don't want to be doing is, is maintaining a high dorsum. It's more aesthetically pleasing to have a lower uh, dorsal height. And the corollary and then also with the round broad faces um, if you maintain dorsal height and dorsal length that accentuates the length of the face so this for example this is a patient she's not a surgical patient she's a filler patient uh, she had filler into the nasal radix and into the the dorsum and a small amount of filler into the um, into the mentum and if you look at the two photographs, you'll see that actually the impression is that she's got a taller, slimmer face on the right. And that's because we've accentuated the length of her nose um, predominantly. So now let's move on to the brow tip or dorsal aesthetic lines. And there are a couple of things that when we're looking and assessing noses that really inspire a lot of enthusiasm. And this is certainly one of them. So, Let's, let's go through them. The, so the dorsal aesthetic line, it starts at the superciliary ridge. It converges between the nasian and the rhinian. What's important is those lines, and there's been a lot of discussion about this, they don't have to be parallel or divergent. In fact, any of those are quite acceptable. So they can be para, uh, parallel, fusiform, uh, which means that they widen slightly at the keystone area or they can be divergent concave lines as in, this, as in this photograph. But I think what the important thing is that they should be continuous, well-defined and symmetrical. And then they should, uh, quarterly, they should connect to the tip defining points. The width of the dorsal aesthetic line should be approximately the width of the filtral columns, uh, or in females, maybe six to eight millimeters was a traditional measurement. I think these days we're actually probably extending that a little bit wider and in males eight to 10 millimeters. So this is a patient and you can see her preoperative photograph and you can see the nose is narrow, deviated and not really any discernible uh, dorsal aesthetic lines. Uh, she's also got a slightly uh, ball tip and this is her post-operative view. 
um, and you can see much better symmetry, slight deviation still, it's better. And on the head down view, you can actually see fairly well-defined dorsal aesthetic lines. That's for three quarter view, basal view. This I just put in out of interest, um, just looking at the theme of dorsal aesthetic lines and you can see she's really narrow at the radix and then becomes extremely broad. And it's just interesting if you look and see on the on the surgical specimen the specimen on the surgical um, uh, film, you can see in fact that the the, uh, um, the septum in fact is actually really the dorsal the uh, uh, cartilaginous dorsum is in fact really narrow. And you think, well, how can it be? And then you just look at the lateral crura, and in fact, that's what's actually creating the width in her nose. And then this is her post-operative view again creating better harmony and basal views. And this I just put in, um, this is the classic inverted V deformity, it's one of our former cases, and you can see this complete disjunction between the bony dorsum and the cartilaginous dorsum. Um, and, uh, and also she's got a really marked uh, nasal um, pinched, uh, a pinched tip. So let's move on um, to the further areas of assessment, the nasal bony base. So this is really where the maxilla turns up onto the nose, so the nasal process of the maxilla. And we want to feel that junction, and it should be about 80% of the intercanthal distance. Why is that important? Well, if it's perhaps up to the width of the, of the canthus acceptable beyond that, it's an absolute indication to narrow the bony base. And I think that's just, you know, we've got a number of criteria we use to do osteotomies, open roof, wide dorsum, but a broad bony base is an absolute indication for narrowing the nose. Um, and then the alar width, we know the alar width should be the width of the, of the, uh, of the canthus, but obviously this is ethnic specific. In African Asian noses, we know that the ali are relatively wider. This is a patient of mine, she didn't want a formal rhinoplasty, but she wanted some improvement. This is her before and after an ALR base at wedge excision. And I also put some filler into her nasal dorsum. There you can see the basal view, looking at the change in the nostril shape and the width. And on frontal view, improvement in the, wet, in the width of the ALR base and narrowing of the dorsum. And again, the concept that I explained earlier is that if you increase the height of the dorsum, you narrow the face. So let's move on to uh, nasal tip shape. And this really refers to the contours and lines of the tip defined by areas of highlights and shadows. And this is also another major interest of aesthetic interest, uh, another area of aesthetic interest, uh, in a way, one of the holy grails of rhinoplasty. And prior to the publication uh, of Jack Sheen's Aesthetic Rhinoplasty in 1978, surgeons analyzed the nose really in a, in a more architectural way, just using lines, uh, lines and angles. Jack Sheen e emphasized the dorsal aesthetic lines for one, but more importantly regarding the tip, he discussed the nasal tip as being an, uh, 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 opposing equilateral triangles with a common base. And that common base uh, is the interdomal distance. And at the end of each are your tip defining points. And in addition, those should be the most projected anterior points of the nose. Uh, the superior apex uh, is the super tip break point, And inferiorly, the inferior triangle is the columella break point. And he described widths of six to eight millimeters in women and eight to 10 millimeters in males. Um, Dean Turimi published this new concept in nasal tip contouring that was in 2006, looking at a number of uh, models and um, beautiful people. And, um, and he looked at surface highlights, shadows, obviously that represent the structure of the underlying cartilaginous framework. The first thing that he noted was, in fact, the flare at the end of the brow tip or the dorsal aesthetic lines. In fact, it flares wider, indicating that, in fact, 
we don't really need to narrow the tip maybe quite as much as was previously thought. But in reference to the tip, he stressed highlights as a horizontal tip highlight that could be augmented with a tip graft, and then two alar lobular highlights that can be accentuated with, with uh, alar rim grafts. And then cephalic to that is an area of shadowing in the supra tip, uh, and that extended laterally into the alar uh, grooves. And then all of you probably be familiar, or if you're not, I recommend um, looking at this article. This is from uh, Barish uh, Kaka and Daniel. This is the surface aesthetics, aesthetics in tip rhinoplasty, a step-by-step -step guide. And what it introduces is a nasal polygon concept, which is excellent in, in conceptualizing uh, nasal aesthetics. And uh, it's based on artistic principles from drawings and sculptures. Um, and the nasal surface aesthetics can be analyzed in terms of a series of connected polygons. So if you look on the right hand side, that's a diagram. And each of those little polygons is actually in reference to a different anatomical area or structure. So you can start, for example, just the, 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 the bony dorsum is the, bo uh, uh, the dorsal bone polygon, and more distantly, the dorsal cartilaginous polygon, and then lateral to the bone, obviously the lateral bony polygon, the upper lateral polygon that goes onto the lateral crust. And it's a lovely way of conceptualizing the relationships of the underlying cartilage and how they relate to the surface uh, architecture. And obviously that has implications in terms of how you need to shape the underlying structure to create the optimal nasal aesthetics. Now the one area that I think really for me made a big difference was the lateral cruel resting angle. Um, and why this is important is that there's a obviously a natural uh, angle between the, 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 lower, the lower lateral cartilage and as it goes on to the lateral crura. Now, when we operate, what we try and do is we put in a domal suture that causes eversion of the caudal border of the lateral crura. That means that the caudal border becomes more prominent. That's where the light reflex needs to be. But more importantly, well, not more importantly, but as importantly, what it does, it rotates the cephalic margin of that lateral crust downwards to create a shadow. And it's this high light and low light that creates an aesthetic tip. And it necessitates an understanding that you're trying to create an angle, a resting angle of less than 100 degrees. I hope that makes sense. All right, let's go on to the profile view. Um, so first of all, the radix area, let's go to the nasion. So this is the deepest set point in the, uh, in the nasofacial angle. It should occur at about the lash line or between the lash and the, and the upper lid crease. It's a critical point in determining the nasofacial angle and nasal length, and it's critical in planning rhinoplasty. It's almost like that's where the start of the nose is. You've got to get that point right. Otherwise, what happens afterwards is going to get incrementally worse. So really important uh, to set uh, the radix or the, the, the nasion correctly. And obviously, if that point is higher, the nose is effectively longer. If that point is lower, it's effectively shorter. The next is the nasofrontal angle. And this really, for me, when I think about it, reflects the depth of the, of the point of the nasion because as that angle gets deeper, uh, the angle gets less and vice versa. If the angle opens up and becomes greater, it means it's, in a way, it's more superficial, more anterior, and you get more confluence of the forehead running into the nose. And that also creates greater length. So the normal, the normal angle between 115 and 130 degrees. I'm sorry, this is where we're starting to get into angles and, and measurements. And this is just a practical example. This is a fellow patient of mine. There on the left-hand side, pre-treatment, that's 112 degrees. She's had filler to the, uh, the radix, the nasion, and, and the 
a sort of bony dorsal area. We've increased that to 125 degrees. At the same time, lengthened her chin slightly, elevated her eyebrows, and given a little bit of prominence onto the cheek. So there you can see her before and after. We've elongated her face by these adjustments, and that's a three-quarter view. So again, I mean, for me, there's a big difference in terms of the appearance. Uh, I, I conceptualize that it's more than just the nose, but again, I think that's an important concept. When we're doing noses, we should be thinking about the face in its entirety, but there's a definite elongation of that nose that accentuates her facial length. Uh, next, the nasofacial angle. So this is measured from a vertical line from the nasian perpendicular to the Frankfurt plane, and then a line drawn from the nasian to the nasal tip. It describes effectively the slant of the nose, and obviously the greater that angle, the, the greater the projection of the nasal tip. And in females, that's generally around about 34 degrees, ideally, and in males, about 36 degrees. This is a patient, uh, this is a simulation. This is before and my simulation. This is her angle, 38 degrees before. This is a post-surgical result, that's 33 degrees. So on the left-hand side is her pre-operative picture, her photographic, that's her Photoshop assessment of what I'd like to try and achieve. And that's a surgical result and there's about a two-year result. Before and after, again, dorsal aesthetic lines down to the tip highlights, improvement in a, in a uh, uh, tip aesthetics. And on the head down helicopter view, you can see improvement in a dorsal aesthetic lines, three-quarter view. And then when it comes to dorsal shape, there's a lot of descriptions to say that the, the dorsal, uh, in females, the dorsal aesthetic line should be about two millimeters below a straight line. And I think it depends very much on the individual. I have patients who want to have a straight nose. I have patients who want to have a little um, a super tip break. I want to have those who want to have slight concavity. And I think as long as the proportions uh, are, are respected, slight differences like that for me don't make a huge difference. I'm not a great fan of a, of a, of a sort of a shrew tip, um, or my patients aren't, but that's personal aesthetic, uh, aesthetics. Generally in men, I think we prefer straight noses. And then just looking at the proportion of the nose, um, this can be described um, by what's called a balanced polygon. So if you look at the nasal, uh, nasal dorsal length measured from the nasian to the tip, and that's represented as NT, then the height of the radix should be about one third of that, and the height of the tip should be about two thirds of that. And that creates a balanced a balanced nose. You can independently assess nasal tip projection if you take a line from the nasian to the tip and the nasian to the alar crease and then join them with a horizontal, um, a horizontal line, uh, um, then the ratio of those should be three to four to five. Alternatively, a, a line dropped from the nasian down to subnasally bisect or intersected with a, a horizontal line to the tip defining point should create a ratio of about 2.8 to 1. So these are just two additional measures. Um, I usually use a balanced polygon. Uh, if I'm happy with the length of the nose, then I'll use the balanced polygon to, to assess my radix height. I know where the radix the position needs to be, um, and then I can assess the nasal tip projection. And then nasal tip rotation. I think this is also really important. We don't want a piggy nose, and we also don't want a, a droopy tip. So the assessment of nasal tip rotation, we use the nasolabial angle. And this is different, just, just to point out, it's different to the labiocolumella angle. And you mustn't get confused between the two. So this is the angle between a line drawn through the long axis of the nose and a line perpendicular through subnasale um, to the Frankfurt plane. So you can see Frankfurt plane there, a line perpendicular that runs through subnasale uh, sub and it bisects that line through the long axis. Um, and in women that should be between about 95 and 110 and men between 90 and 100. And obviously 
Um, if the angle's greater, it implies that you've got a greater uh, a, a cephalic rotation or caudal rotation as that goes down. And this is an example actually of a filler patient uh, that had um, filler uh, to the uh, columella antenatal spine to elevate the, the tip. There you can see the angle went from 96 to 108, and there's the effect of, of the nasal tip rotation. And then this is uh, another relationship that's also quite useful, um, the columella lobular angle. And this really looks at the rotation of the tip from the columella break point up to the tip defining point. So it's a line that runs along the columella and then it tracks the angle from the columella break point towards the nasal tip. And ideally that should be about 30 to 45. If that angle is greater, it usually is associated with either a hanging columella or otherwise a large infratip lobule. And this is an example of a patient before that angles about 47 degrees and post-operatively about 35 degrees. And then alar columella angle, sorry guys, this is um, alar columella angle, the relationship, this is also really important. We hear a lot about retracted alar as people resect the cephalic margin um, uh, of, the, of the lower lateral cartilage. Uh, we get retraction and that pulls up and you get a, an, an, an alar retraction. So it's, it's an important concept in aesthetics. Um, and the way we work it out is if you draw a line through the long axis of the nostril, and then in the midpoint of that nostril, you draw a perpendicular line that goes from the alar rim through onto the columella. And each of those two limbs from A to line B and C to line B should be the same distance and not more than two millimeters. So if you look at this chart, this really classifies different types of um, alar columella disproportion. So if line C is longer, it refers to a hanging columella. Um, if A is longer, it's a retracted alar. If both are longer, that's a combination of a hanging columella and a retracted alar. And then of course you can have a hanging alar where A is shorter, a retracted columella where C is shorter, or again, a combination of both. Um, this is one for the max facts. They're used to looking at um, Kepler metrograms. But I think the important thing for me here is just an appreciation really of facial convexity. So this is a line from the glabella to subnasally to the pagonian. And obviously, if you have maxillary, um, if your maxilla is protruded, that angle is going to go down. If your, if your chin is very prominent, then your angle is going to go up. So it's just a concept of understanding the, the, the facial shape that the nose sits on. More relevant to the nose really is the, the, the nasomental angle. Um, and this describes the nasal tip position and nasal dorsal inclination in relation to the chin. And obviously an, an, an over projecting tip or retrogenia obviously will reduce that angle. And the normal angle is around about 130 with a range of 120 to 132. Um, I'm getting to the end guys. Hang in there. And this is um, a Ricketts E line. Robert Ricketts uh, was an orthodontist and he described the relationship between the nose, lips, and chin. And he termed this the aesthetic plane or E plane. And it's used to describe a balance between, or he used it to describe a balance between the smile and the nose and the chin. Um, and if you draw a line between the nasal tip and the pagonian, the upper lip should be about four millimeters from there and the lower lip about two millimeters. If the lips are closer um, to the E-plane or even anterior to it, he said the lips and teeth will dominate the smile when the nose and chin, with, sorry, with the nose and chin appearing weak. And if the lips are further behind the plane, it's more likely the nose and chin will dominate the smile. I thought that was a very nice way of understanding what the value of this is in terms of balance. And obviously there are multiple factors that will influence this in terms of tip projection, in terms of chin projection, uh, and then obviously a whole host of, of uh, orthognathic uh, issues. Um, and then just from the base, um, 
There's obviously much ethnic variance um, in Caucasians. It's often described as an equilateral triangle on the base. Um, but it's important, obviously, that the nostrils are as symmetrical as possible, that the columella is straight. Sorry, and the important thing also on basal view is that you don't want to have any pinching of the alley. You want to have straight lateral walls. So on the base view, you can divide them into thirds. Uh, so from the tip, uh, the tip segment, which is really your infralobular segment, your columella segment, and then the foot plates. So the diagram on the right really is representative of the different, different areas, and each of those usually about a third. So guys, in conclusion, um, rhinoplasty really is an extremely demanding uh, procedure, uh, incredibly rewarding, rewarding at the same time. It's a, I always think it's a little bit like golf, is that you can never perfect it. You can keep practicing and actually consistency is kind of what it's about. But preparation is absolutely the most fundamental thing. And so again, knowing your anatomy and really knowing the normal aesthetics is the key to, to performing rhinoplasty. So in this way, knowing the ideals of nasal aesthetics really is an absolutely vital component. Um, and then just, just to emphasize, Remember that you've also got to always look at the nose, never in isolation. Always look at it in context with the rest of the face. Patients want to improve and enhance the way they look. And so you can't just be looking at the nose ever. You've got to look at how that nose relates to the face. Thanks very much. Jeanette. Congratulations, eh? Uh, yeah. Top of your game, eh? That was really a thorough, sure. excellent talk, I eh? It really know. went on. <laughs> no, 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 really, that was great, Stu. Thank you very much. So, um, Amir's just put out that CME survey. Um, uh, I'm just trying to pick up one or two questions that have come through here. Um, Jose Patrocinio, who's the head of the International Federation of Fire Plastic Surgeons, says excellent talk Stuart. So, so there's a question here which I can't quite understand from um, Heidelberg is what is your favorite angle? Favorite angle? <laughs> you know I think that's the thing Cam it's I mean it's a it's never it's never a single thing I mean it's a combination of everything and you know I think I think everything is interrelated uh, and it's the for me it's the balance and harmony and proportion really and trying to understand how those all fit together that that sort of create visually appealing results and then of course to technically to achieve it is a whole different story mm. Mm. um dr ramavath would like to know if you have your own book or which book you would recommend <laughs> We go to the YouTube. We're going to keep it on YouTube. So, now in terms of maybe uh, actual rhinoplasty books, which are the was, ones that yeah, you? I, mean, I know you sleep a, next, you've got really, some that are next to your bed at night, eh? I, I do. Yeah. I mean, I've got a. I mean, I've got a number of uh, books. I've got uh, uh, um, uh, Dean Turimi's, uh three books. is fantastic. I've got. I've got uh, Boris Checkers, uh, Roland Daniels. I've got uh, Dallas rhinoplasty. Uh, and then a number of a number of uh, papers and articles uh, on the subject as well. That lot, I mean, a lot's been published. Hmm. Um, we we've just hit one hour now. Um, I'm I'm going to Peter. If you're still around, I'm actually going to because Stuart's been very thorough with what you've done there. Um, if more questions come up, I'm going to keep asking that. But I know we're just going to give you guys an extra little bit tonight that you weren't counting on. And Peter's got a, a short talk on his 10 tips. So, Peter, are you happy to go ahead and give us uh, that? <coughs> totally. I've, uh, uh, had to, I've shared my screen um, and see if we can bring this up. Okay, let's fly into that. This was a nice format I did for the ASAPS meeting, and it's uh, we've tried it on our own one. It was 10 pills in 10 minutes. We had uh, <coughs> guys like Fouad Nahai and Al Ali and a bunch of them talking on various topics. I, I won't go through all of them, but it will just highlight 
a few bits and pieces. So <clears throat> I attended a wonderful meeting, Giovanni Botti, Lake Garda, and um, he got some really awesome guys. He had five sets of twins, all very evenly matched, and uh, surgeons were doing open versus close. So <clears throat> choose what you go for. I think as a junior plastic surgeon, ENT surgeon, rhinoplasty surgeon, um, an open rhinoplasty gives you the better anatomy and easier anatomy to work with. But once you get very uh, competent, then uh, <clears throat> then you can go to, for something fancy. And this is a, a gull wing. On the other side there, I've got uh, my stair step incision. Surprisingly enough, at the meeting, they did a vote at the end and uh, more people were going for um, close rhinoplasty, but it was quite a radical one compared to what I was taught many years ago. And uh, it's really, they dissect out, did they just leave a little bit of skin across the front there? Um, <clears throat> these are the other uses of open rhinoplasty. <clears throat> this is a, one of my patients who's a cleft, bilateral cleft, doing a VY advancement. And that's a nice sort of useful bit to lengthen that there. Pill number two, osteoplasty versus osteotomy. And, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, can you just rasp the dorsum and rasp the sides and get a nice result, or do you need to actually um, do an osteotomy? And uh, this just shows it in clear detail. This kind of guy, you're not going to get a good result. These guys, if you don't do osteotomies, and these young girls, you can get away very nicely with an osteoplasty. And the big advantage is a very rapid recovery. Um, and they like you for that. They don't get as much bruising. Um, they don't get as much swelling. And uh, I, I would think uh, with the guidance of a mentor, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a decision you need to make on the operating table. If, if the, uh, if they're very flared, if they flare outwards quite a bit, as Stuart was talking about, you're not going to get that down with an osteoplasty. You, uh, you, you're just going to end up with sort of tissue paper on the side that you will need to do some sort of osteotomy. Um, spread of grass versus spread of flaps. And this is something I was talking about earlier. And here we have put in our spreader grafts. And then uh, I learned this from Enrico Robotti. Take those upper lateral cartilages over the top and stitch them together. Some people do it as a continuous, I do it as a series of interrupted, and I go quite high, almost to the keystone. And uh, if they're not right, uh, take them out, you know, just play around with that till you get it right. And then one of the other options is just to bring them level with your spreader graph. So you can either take them over the top or take them level. Look what gives you, uh, if, you if you take them level here and over the top there, it'll give you a nice bit of super tip fullness if you need it. Um, Colin Miller strut grafts versus septal extension grafts, and I covered this very briefly in my um, uh, in my video there. And basically, if you want to elevate and rotate the tip, you need this septal extension graft. There's some quite nice papers. I think Rod Roark and uh, uh, and one of the PRSs went through them thoroughly, looking at Colin Miller struts and septal extension. And I would say that <clears throat> this is probably one of my more common revisions that I have to do because I was taught to do Cody Miller struts and they've come back to me four or five years later and that tip has gone down a little bit and uh, the septal extension graft and uh, you need to read up and look at the papers on that and I'm sure somebody will talk in it in more detail gives you uh, very nice firm support. Um, this is a bit of a um, so something that's probably you will need to find out about as you go along and make your own mistakes but if you have a look at these patients we were all taught to uh, take off the caudal, uh, the rostral edge of the um, low lateral cartilage, <clears throat> which we did. And because I followed my patients up so long, you can see that you start getting a caudal, you start getting this uh, snarl or pull up of the upper lateral cartilage and you get a show, low lateral cartilage rather than you're getting a show of the collimella. And uh, this is where <clears throat> um, uh, we can try various other flaps and I'm still feeding my way around these. They work very nicely in cleft patients where <clears throat> you can do it, instead of cutting it off, turn it under or slide it through. And it's, um, uh, if you've got concave, uh, sorry, convex, and that is convex, and if you put it underneath, you get a nice straight, strong lateral cris. <clears throat> and here's a few more details of this young patient that we did that to. And here's a sequence of him going through. These are uh, one of the joys of your find of plastic surgery and rhinoplasty, I kind of first met him when he was about an hour old. So he and I have had a long journey together and you'll, you'll get patients like that you take through your career. And you can see we did a bone graft on him uh, <coughs> uh, and then did rhinoplasty and we got a reasonable result on him here. 
um, ALA rim grafts. Um, I'm doing them in a lot of cases now, and that is to anticipate that um, <coughs> uh, retraction of the ALA cartilage. And that's where you saw that I did my incision on the caudal edge of the lower lateral cartilage to give me enough uh, skin here, enough rim that I could make a pocket and, uh, and put another thin little piece of cartilage. Uh, and these are your classic cases where you really need it. Look at these, how they collapse and get inspiration views in them. And <coughs> the soft triangle is deficient. And uh, that's where you can put in an ALA rim graft and sort that out. Um, I'm not going into too much detail of this because I think Philia is going to do a very nice talk on us uh, in, a, in a week's time. And this is her area of expertise. But <coughs> you're, you're doing um, surgery on the psyche when you do rhinoplasty. And uh, they're all the stories of surgeons who've been killed by their patients because they didn't kind of achieve what their patient was after. Why do you fail? Poor patient selection, unrealistic, poor assessment, poor technique, uh, creating a functional problem, unpredictable healing, and psychological problems. Again, Philio will talk on this. Simon stands for single, immature, male, obsessive, narcissistic. And I'm going to show you a bunch of photographs here and, uh, <coughs> you know, sort of... Uh, Look at these patients and uh, you know who's who's liable to give you a problem and uh, i'll just this is the kind of rhinoplasty you want to be doing when you're a junior surgeon rhinoplasty surgeon in south africa we call him a burrosian or farmer's son and he's the average guy that goes to college plays football gets punched in the nose and all he wants to do is sort of have a reasonable nose that he can breathe out of so uh, uh they're, they're quite forgiving patients to work on these sort of patients are going to be very uh, very fussy with what you do. So you're going to have to really hit it, be on the top of your game and hit a home run with these guys there. Um, so manage your patient's expectations. Under promise, over deliver. This is classic Rod Rorick. Be on the same wavelength. Repeat your information several times. Do your, comp uh, do your several consultations. The perfectionist will be disappointed. And if, if you don't connect, if they're unrealistic, don't operate. Um, if they don't understand what you can achieve, um, uh, don't operate and uh, you know one of the, the nice things uh, that we've talked about in these uh, talks is you know what three things worry you about your nose I think uh, Cameron's brought that up on a few occasions and they should be able to do that and that's why I do my second and third visits this I'm not going into because uh, uh, we, we've had a very nice talk in it before but uh, it basically um, it boils down to the, the skin conditions that go with these patients and in my kind of age uh, patients I deal with I look at the acne scar and you've got to sort of manage this stuff actively with these people or acne rosacea. And I think your classic is this beautiful Ferrari, courtesy of Saul Braun, who I think is on the group here. He said to, sent me a photo, I asked him about it. He says, I've got just the photo for you. Beautiful car, but the outside isn't good. So you've got to look at the dermatology and, uh, um, and uh, <coughs> address that point as well. Uh, so acne, and I'm not going to labor this because of time, uh, you know, there the are articles about it, and I'm going to give you the references. You can go and read them yourself. This is a brilliant article um, in ASJ by Erin Cousins and Zainabaji, which goes through the whole dermatology and acne treatment. And of course, uh, it wouldn't be complete without Baum and Guyurin having a, um, a, a paper, a similar article, but just, you know, managing thick skin patients. Um, and just basically my, my protocols here is uh, we stop retin-A 10 days before surgery and restart six weeks afterwards. And uh, this really does work. I edited a paper the other day where um, if your patient happens to be on ret uh, uh, isotretinoin, the swelling in the nose will go down quicker over the first year. They won't get a better result, but uh, their recovery will be a lot quicker. So just to get to the end of this, what have I changed? No permanent sutures. I use 5-OPDS on a round body needle. It's all about structure and function, spread across, collimetagross, septal extension. Um, I prefer suture techniques from now rather than tip grafts. Um, uh, this is a debatable issue, the turnover grafts and rostral trim, ADOS snarls. I use quite a bit of donor cartilage. Um, I know uh, in Europe there are restrictions on this, but I know that Rod Roy does use a, quite a bit of it, and I've been doing so for about four years with good results. Um, Piezza, osteoplasty, osteotomies and the nasal skin I've talked about. So things to watch here, fat injections, uh, this is sort of getting a bit probably advanced, but it helps soften scar tissue, disguises minor imperfections, 
try and eliminate dead space. We haven't talked about Patangi's ligament but it's, um, uh, and muscle, but it's kind of very important. Watch the space for preservation rhinoplasty, and it's all about the scroll. And these are kind of things that are going to trouble you as you get more and more into rhinoplasty surgery. Just a little bit on patients where we did some fat injection instead of filler, and it, uh, we use nano fat for these patients. And just a patient of mine who's had umpteen operations, um, it started out with a bit of a botched uh, septoplasty initially, so she's got a huge perf. And at one time we thought she was a veganous granulomatosis, but anyway, we've gone through it, used uh, donor cartilage, made a, basically L strut spreader grafts, spreader flaps, and a nice result. And these are just <clears throat> a patient who's had some nothing else here. Secondary, he had a good rhinoplasty, but he was concerned about this. And we just put a little bit of fat in. Eva Ciel is on the talk, I think, still. And this is uh, something that she did for us. We do, she's the very good at, um, uh, uh, we'll just call her the fat queen. She does uh, all the fat injections and, and uh, uh, she's on the Regenerative Medicine Society. So she's very good on, on uh, fat injections on the face, which we do sometimes at the same time as our rhinoplasty surgery and just subtle things here, just to get uh, that there. And he in fact could breathe a lot better. So thank you very much. This is just my, my standard uh, story, rhinoplasty is an exercise in intellectual honesty. Thank you for uh, letting us um, throw you a few pearls at you there. Okay, Cam, back to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That, that, that's great, guys. Um, well done. So um, I think I'm going to call it an, an, a night. We, we, we've gone over quite a lot. We've had a, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, part of these talks will be put onto the YouTube channel for you to watch later. Um, otherwise, next Sunday, we've got uh, Filio Lakakis. She's going to be telling you all about photography. Um, it's such an important part of, of your operating. So we're looking forward to having her. Um, one of our new PhD uh, uh, graduates, can I say? So thank you very much for everyone for your involvement. And please feel free to use the uh, WhatsApp groups for communication, talk about rhinoplasty, ask questions. The only way you're going to grow is by... Um, asking questions. Okay, so have a great evening, everybody, and thank you, Stuart and Peter. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.